Hello and welcome to the Global Dialogue. I'm Shireen Bhan and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome on the program someone that we get on the channel very often but always in the middle of a very snow-clad Davos. So it's uh, wonderful to see Jasper Brodin, uh, the Global CEO of IKEA here on a very sunny uh, but still spring morning in Delhi. Jasper, thanks so much and appreciate you joining us here in India. Thank you. It's lovely. I see no snow uh, wherever <laughs> I look and I must say I've been, I haven't been visiting Delhi many times. This is a lovely time of year to be here. It, As a Swede, this is summer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, not summer yet. Not no, the Indian <laughs> summer just yet. It is, it is spring for us. Yes. But, you know, Jasper, let's, let's talk about the view on India. And I know mm. you have, of course, been uh, long-term committed investors to India. But you also need to have a lot of patience, as you keep saying, uh, to stay committed and invested in India. Mm. You've just returned from visiting your Gurgaon facility, which is still in the works. It's work in progress. What's the status on that? The status is it looks good. We are uh, basically deep in construction right now and um, the uh, IKEA store will be as quite often these days and uh, not only an IKEA store it's going to be a shopping center and there will be some other facilities as well. So that means it's a quite uh, complicated and big project for us uh, but as we are in IKEA we try to think long term. We try to think about uh, not just being here for the short term when it comes to uh, driving our business, but actually establish ourselves for decades and a long period uh, ahead. And I, I can tell you a fun story, actually. When I, one of the last times I met our founder, who passed away a few years ago, as an old successful entrepreneur, I asked him about the future, and I asked him, how should we think about the future, Ingvar? He said, you should think long term. And then I asked him, how long term? And he said, yeah, 200 years, he said. <laughs> but I can promise you, we're going to open uh, Delhi before 200 years. <laughs> well, I, I would certainly hope so. Uh, but, you know, so you've got Gurgaon coming up. Noida still, Correct. still mm -hmm. a couple of years away from, from uh, you know, being ready for, uh, for operation. And Delhi, no plans yet? So basically, uh, in the Great Delhi, we are looking at actually doing what we have rarely done before. We're going to open online first. So we are deep in preparations now for logistics, digital capacity to actually open our um, uh, online experience first. And then the store will come in maybe one and a half year or thereabouts, I think. Uh, and uh, as we then progress with Noida, we're looking into other sites and opportunities in Delhi. Uh, to this date, uh, we don't have more to share, but I think my team will probably uh, be able to respond to you before I meet you in the snow next time. <laughs> so by 2030, mm. uh, you know, because we're talking long term, not 200 years, but Correct. a couple of years uh, <laughs> out. Uh, how large is the IKEA presence likely to be in India? Well, it is, it is what we are basically working with right now. The first chapter for us was to, to build the first door, uh, which has, as you know, opened some five and a half years yeah. ago in, in um, Hyderabad. We, we, um, that was to prove to ourselves we could and that there was a market and there was an interest. And you can say the experience has been phenomenal for us. The interest is massive. Uh, after that, we opened in uh, Mumbai, Bengaluru, and now Delhi is on the map. Um, but the long-term plan for us is to establish IKEA in all big cities and then expand in an omnichannel context um, in India so we can reach as many people as possible. We are, you can say, on one hand, we have to be a bit patient because be building big IKEA stores mm. takes a bit of time. Um, building industry capabilities for the volumes that IKEA is supporting is basically um, a game of not only supporting IKEA, but making sure there are entrepreneurs, investors, uh, there is export uh, as part of it, because in, in the beginning, we need to build volumes where we rely a bit on export before uh, it can benefit the domestic market. Mm -hmm. uh, normally it takes a decade or thereabout to, to get all of these things in, in place. Um, but we are truly, on the other hand, in then in a hurry to build those volumes so that we can reach more people and also work the economy of scale to bring even more affordability to people. You know, you talked about uh, your big stores, but let's talk about the experiment with the small store. Yes. You have decided now to close uh, the R City store in Mumbai and consolidate yes. your operations. Explain to me why you felt the need to do that. Was it an experiment that didn't work out? Obviously, as for your expectations, are you giving up on the small store format plan? Uh, what's the story there? Yep, the story is, so basically we have concluded that the small stores will be part of the IKEA a concept as we uh, see it. Um, we, we started the project around 2018, I think, 
when we said we need to experiment not only with online services, but also how do we bring IKEA closer to the city centers. And the analysis wasn't that difficult to understand. A lot of people limited capacity to move to the outskirts of the city. Um, so we wanted to bring the physical experience to people in a smaller for format then. Um, we have done, I think we have done probably about 40, 50 of those. I think we might have closed some 10 of them. Typically we learned that uh, we need to be in prime location. We need to also build it in a certain flow so that it um, uh, enables for people to find what they need to find. And the uh, Mumbai store that we recently closed was one of those where we basically weren't in a hot spot enough. So um, it's, I wouldn't uh, say, you know, these smaller stores are quite, uh, they are smaller decisions for us because of course the investments is uh, very small compared to Noid and uh, Gurgram. But I'm sure that we're gonna continue to find ways also in India to establish uh, smaller stores. So you're not Next giving time. up no, on the small no, 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 no. strategy? No, 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 we, we, but I'm, I'm also open to test and try, mm. which means also in the future, we might say that didn't work. That's part of being an entrepreneur. So um, hopefully we will test and try many more things here. And part of that will be sometimes we have to give up and say that didn't work. Mm. You know, speaking of testing and trying, uh, one of the other things that is interesting about IKEA is now your reorientation into the world of digital and e-commerce. Yes. And in many <laughs> ways, you've come late to <clears throat> this party, which has sort of taken off post-COVID. What's been the big lesson for you through that? I will never admit that? that. No, just joke aside. You know, we I think we were late in, in um, entering into the online uh, um, journey. And I reflected over that. I think sometimes your success can be your biggest enemy. So we were basically pushing the buttons around 2017. Uh, already then we had started to do prep preparatory work for online, but we were not that far, to be honest. So um, we, took, we took basically, it's a wonderful story because we took a world around, uh, around the world uh, journey, met customers, mm. I think in 16 uh, countries. And they all said, we love IKEA, we want to go to IKEA, but we want to be able to access you on a Tuesday evening when we put the kids to bed and we just need to buy something and get it home delivered. We didn't have that capability. So we started to work on it. And interesting enough and challenging, of course, enough, a pandemic came along. And suddenly two things happened. The interest for life at home was at peak in every country all over the world at the same time. And secondly, Online was the only way we could maintain our business. So we had weeks and months where online was 100% of IKEA. At the time of the outbreak of the pandemic, we had few countries that were ready, but we managed to in four or five weeks actually get all of IKEA online prepared. And so you can say in a way, the pandemic helped to speed up things for IKEA. And today, even if we admit a lot of opportunities to, to progress, um, we have the capability to run both our stores uh, run the online side, the services, and the beauty of it is the mix actually of all, because that's what uh, people asked me some seven, eight years ago, are you gonna be online or offline? Interesting enough, 87% of our customers are both. So there are very few people who use only one channel today. Yes, omni-channel clearly seems mm. to be now the, the road ahead for every brand. But what's been the big learning for you? Because as you pointed out that, you know, you you didn't anticipate this mm. change in the marketplace. And when it happened, it happened so fast and furiously. Have there been other examples or mm. other lessons through the course of your career and your journey at IKEA? I think so. Where mm. you've been slow to respond because one of the, mm. the jobs of a CEO is to anticipate change. Mm. How, how do you now incorporate the lessons from this experience into being able to anticipate change better? Well, it's a big question and it's a lovely one, I think, um, to a certain degree, deliciously complicated because <laughs> what you have to do, I think, um, with a legacy company as IKEA that has 80 years now of experience, um, how do you actually, from a leadership point of view, both love the past and create the future? I think if you, if you lean towards creating the future only, you might lose yourself. You might copy others and, um, and lose the strengths that you've built over the years. If you get too romantic and if your review mirrors are bigger than your front window, you will uh, look for the answers in the past and you will miss the, uh, what I believe in a world that if we see disruption and development speeding up, you will of course miss the trains of the future. So in a way, I think the beauty is not to put the past and the future against each other. Um, but it honestly means for any company with, um, 
with uh, years of good legacy to be to avoid complacency, to be afraid of your own success, to make sure that you invest in the fragility of ideas, to that to allow yourself to do mistakes, to uh, to test things, to close, to move on, and I do believe that part of leadership is more difficult than claim the past, if you say, because the past is known, the future isn't. So therefore, I think as a leader, you have to do a much better job in anticipating and being open to the future. So what, what is your process of being able to do that? I mean, how do you create a culture where you encourage people to take risks, where you encourage people to make mistakes, trial and error, mm. uh, you know, incubate new ideas? How do you create that culture? Is there, is there a good. process that you've put in place? I, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, I would have said yes. Now I said I don't really know. <laughs> but the interesting thing, I think, you can to a certain extent manage and lead processes for development and innovation. I think the next level is that you need to have a transformative leadership. So you need to have the courage to talk about um, uh, creating the future and creating visions of that future without having the proof points. But more and more over the years, I've started to believe that it's even more important to build a culture um, and that culture will be the strongest way for you to actually uh, enable not only your you know, management, but actually the whole community, including your partners, that curiosity of the future and exploring the future is part of what we do. Um, so that, that cultural element, I think, is something that I try to stimulate. And as an example then, I, I think in my desperation maybe, but so I have invented the banana card is uh, in IKEA. <laughs> and that is basically has been handed out uh, wide and large to people, which means you have a go bananas card. Okay. And that means that it's basically a, an apology for a mistake that has not yet happened. But the good thing is I've already co-signed an apology for that mistake. <laughs> a go bananas yes, card. Yeah. So that, that, that's what so, you hand out to people, is it? Exactly. <laughs> and, and it's more to say, to symbolize, to say, it's not only allowed, I expect you to do mistakes. And when you do, uh, we can apologize or we can laugh about it, we move on. Of course, not serious mistakes that would be harmful in any way to business or people or, or such, but to stimulate the thought of the, where the uh, passion for the idea and the curiosity for um, acting on your idea is bigger than the fear of doing the mistake. So how many the go banana cards have you, have you handed out? And, and Are you, do you want the banana card? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy, I'd be happy to good. take one. <laughs> I think we, we're talking about probably a couple of thousand banana cards now. And, and the thing is, uh, I'm happy to hand out the banana card to anyone uh, who is happy to take a risk. And we do uh, follow-ups as well on these mistakes. Uh, yeah, and yeah. have any of those ideas that have come via banana cards actually translated into business decisions? Many. So I, I think people are uh, using, it's become a, a fun thing as well. So we see, uh, we see uh, everything from our country managers in our, in our big uh, countries, to store managers, to people working in digital exploration. Uh, refer to, to that uh, and some of them are being very tactical also to use it afterwards to apologize for something that went wrong. <laughs> I, I've actually only, I tell you a fun story, I, the, the banana card partly looked like a Swedish driver's license. By accident I gave that to a policeman uh, in, in Sweden when, on a customs control and he said it's not applicable. Uh, <laughs> You so that's my mistake. <laughs> that you was like. your mistake. You had a you had the banana card that you co-signed. <laughs> I do have it. <laughs> but you know, Jasper, you talked about curiosity and exploring the future, mm. uh, and not romanticizing necessarily the past, but mm. ensuring that you protect the past as well as move mm. forward into the future. Uh, what shape? do you see IKEA taking? I mean, of course, now much more of this sort of digital avatar. Mm. But what shape do you see IKEA taking as you move mm. towards your, uh, you know, your century? Mm. It is an interesting question because you can say what will be the same and what will be different. And as always, it's difficult to predict the future, right? But I would say if I would be a little bit uh, courageous to, to at least say with some certainty, I think what we know for, for certain is that homes will be important in 10, 50, 100 years, 200 years from now. So the aspect of homes and what it provides with its functionality, but also emotionally what it means for people will continue to be ever so important. And therefore, I place myself with confidence that the role of IKEA, you can say on one hand, could be seen as uh, commercially selling uh, furniture. 
Uh, but what we're really here to do, and what we're here to do in India, to be part of a movement making homes better, safer, and affordable for millions of people. And as much as the PNL is an important instrument, obviously, obviously for achieving that, um, the um, passion that I hold and my team hold is that we will actually make homes better. This I'm certain of. How to do it? Um, some of the changes that will and actually, I would say we see the early signs already now. And it is, in a way, a lovely perspective that is offered to us. We live in a generation mm. and in a decade when a lot of crises are happening at the same time. And I think it's inviting all of us to rethink uh, some of the actions that we've been taking and how do we want to set ourselves up for the future. So what we change is obviously retailing has already changed and we continue to yeah. change. How do you reach people uh, uh, is part of what we do. Digitalization is, of course, uh, an important aspect of that, including AI and whatnot. But maybe the biggest transformation for us is sustainability. Mm. So becoming 10 billion people on the planet and becoming more people in India means basically we will need to become much better in sharing resources, making sure everybody is part of the movement. Um, so aspects of circularity, um, into our business model is no longer just a good idea, it's a necessity. Aspects as renewable energy uh, for, for carbon, for climate change, for the air that we breathe is an absolute necessity. But all of these things are also a necessity from a cost point of view. So I would say the biggest transformation I, I think we have ahead of us is sustainability. Mm -hmm. You know what, it's interesting that you talk about sustainability because I think uh, while everyone is good intentioned about wanting to move forward on that, there are many aspects of it which are complex. Mm. It requires change within the organization. It also requires perhaps to sort of work with external stakeholders, but there's a cost mm. involved as mm. well uh, when we talk about the green transition. Mm. What's been the biggest lesson and the biggest learning for you as IKEA, as you've made this transition uh, mm. towards mm. circularity etc. What is it that you would like to share as your Very learnings good. with other companies? Th thank you for that question. I think having been part of IKEA since 95, if I would pick one of my only one learning that I have in IKEA, it is truly that I'm deeply convinced over these years and the proof points that it is good business to be a good business. It started for me in, in actually South, uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, with um, implementing the strictest code of conduct that I think still exists um, uh, today on production for people and for environment. At that time, I still remember as a junior in the company, the hesitations, the fear of cost, yeah. which is always there, only to find out as we implemented it that our code of conduct drove improved quality. As we improved quality, it actually lowered cost. It improved motivation for people. And as it improved motivation for people, you had uh, retention, you had less cost of change, you had improved quality across the, the whole span. And I believe as a fundamental principle for the future, we need to believe that being good for people and planet is also going to be good for, for business. Um, if you think about the opposite, exploitation of nature, exploitation of people is obviously, you know, for some business model could be maybe possible in the short term. But except for the ethical perspective, there's, that's a dead end. By being in harmony with nature and being in harmony with people, we think we can actually prosper and grow. And as such, we see in IKEA today um, as one of the most, one of the coolest things I think we have achieved the last decades is since Paris Agreement, we actually have grown our business with almost 31%, 30.9%. And at the same time, we have decoupled carbon by 24.3% absolute. So there you have one of the strongest proof points in the world that uh, not only IKEA stores, but the, the, from the forest to the consumer, we're actually capable to decarbonize ourselves. And it's not been done adding cost or prices. We are growing. So it seems, you know, decarbonization is economically the smart thing to do. And having said that, obviously there are, you know, there are some hurdles, there are some pain points, there are some places where we need to go and speak to the governments, the government of India to say, we need your help to together change the infrastructure for the future. And here, I, I believe we are also quite optimistic because um, both governments and companies, big companies now, have understood that climate change is not something we can pass on to yeah. the next generation. It's us and it's now.
It's us, and it is now. But you mm. know, you talked about the government of India, and there have been many changes in policy with the idea of encouraging companies to make in India, mm. to make in India, not just for India, but to make in India for the world. IKEA has, of course, mm. been using India to procure for your export markets for many, many years now. Uh, take me through what you see on that front over the next five to ten years, mm. using I, I see, India um, to make for the world. I understand. No, but I, I think, um, uh, and first of all, I'm very optimistic about the prospect. There are a couple of uh, puzzle pieces that we also need to work together, government and big uh, companies, in order to, uh, to make it happen. Uh, it's not only an opportunity that can happen, but it will happen. And the question is more, how soon can we make it happen? Today, IKEA sources about 30% uh, of the sales already in India. And remember, India is still retail-wise. We are still in the beginning only. Yeah. And normally, we need some 10, 12 stores to get critical mass in more areas. So it is a game of building up the retail capacity and at the same time, invest in production capacity. Normally, we would like to work with local partners to do that. We invest in the retail side and we ask uh, industries to invest in the uh, uh, furniture production, if you like. And then, in order to balance the timing here, export is essential. And it will also be good for the long run, yeah. of course, uh, for India to be, be uh, taking a share in the export industry, where today India is, is uh, not, uh, I think, represented in, in the right uh, levels. Mm. The uh, Indian government has an ambition of $2 trillion for export, and we would like to offer our competence um, our markets outside India, mm -hmm. but also, uh, of course, the growth that we are building within India to be part of that change. And in order for that to happen, I think one of the most important topics right now is to get together the quality uh, control order question right. So in the endeavor of setting and harmonized um, uh, landscape of, of uh, requirements for products, um, uh, that needs to be set in a way so that we, uh, the industry in total, actually can fulfill the, the demands, fulfill it without adding uh, unnecessary cost to the customers and make sure that it's also harmonized for the export. Um, and this is one of the things that we are now, we are on one hand appreciated to be actually part of the dialogue, um, but it's also one of our worry points right now. How do we make this happen so we actually harmonize for export and make sure that we are capable to deliver? So this is an impediment at this point in time. Mm. Is it because there's a lack of regulation or is there too much regulation? What is the big worry? I think, you know, it's a super interesting topic because we are impressed by the speed of the government in acting on those changes. If you look at the last uh, period, there has been an incredible ambition to, to move into modernization. So the idea itself is uh, perfect and it's the right one to embark. For once, um, we have sometimes complained of governments being too slow. Now we say, you know, wait a minute, we need to be part of, the industry needs to be part of the making sure we actually can deliver to it. So it requires, I think, um, a couple of more rounds of deep engagement with us, with representatives of the furniture industry in India, and to consider the benefit both of the domestic opportunity of growth, but also the opportunity of taking the export. Um, I'm sure this will happen because it makes all the sense in the world, it's common sense. But we have still some work to be done in order to, to remove some of the worry points uh, for us as a business. So, you know, given the fact that uh, you said that you require at least 10 to 12 retail stores uh, in order for you to be able to really scale up production, mm. and that's what's uh, the experience globally, you're very far from that number here in India. So do you believe that there could be a decoupling of what you do in India for retail versus what you do in India for the export mm. market? Now I'm reminded how, how good memory you have. <laughs> so, thank you. No, but I, I think, you know, obviously the market allows for much more than 10 stores, IKEA stores. And even, even if we would be much more ambitious than that, uh, our global market share is normally below short of 10%. So we have never had the ambition to dominate any market. But what we can do is we can stimulate a movement, and we have seen that in many countries um, that a lot of people benefit from, including them, <clears throat> in particular, I would say the value chains, both in production, but also in services and so on. Typically from historically, IKEA brings at least a factor of times 10 when it comes to providing jobs. Mm -hmm. So 10 times more than ourselves. And I think in India, it's obviously even more. Now, um, going forward, it's, um, I am eager to find ways how we can meet more of the Indian consumers faster. 
And it is a game of investing. Uh, we have committed to uh, 10,500 core investment and I can share with you today. I'm not going to give you a number even if you ask, <laughs> but I can tell you we will over deliver. And uh, we are right now looking into how, what is the next uh, actually step that we would take from an investing in, in India. Um, but some of the aspects that I referred to before needs to be sort of said, uh, checked and, and crossed before we can move into the next level of investment. And with that in mind, I think online digital capabilities and possibly experimenting with new ways of finding customers will be part of us moving a little bit faster in India. So by when do you think you'll be ready to make the announcement or uh, be clear about the next leg of your investments? Uh, so unfortunately, it, time it, is up now. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can, I can uh, promise you that my team will come back to you within uh, this year, at least. And then I'm conservative to say, here are the new numbers that we uh, are willing to share. Um, again, we have a couple of uh, discussions points with officials and with representatives of governments to make sure that we gain enough confidence to say uh, we are ready to take the next step of investment. Is it likely to be the same number <laughs> that you replicate or, or a higher given the experience that uh, or I the consumption story that you see? I promise you it's a number you like. <laughs> <laughs> it's a number More than that, that I can't say. <laughs> okay, but within 2024 is, is when you will make the decision about the next phase of investment. We will do so. Well, you know, you, you, it's an interesting thing, and that's what I want to end uh, by talking to you about, Jesper. You said mm. that in every market that we operate, we're about 10% or more, but we don't want to dominate the market. That's a very different philosophy from uh, other companies. You know, it's the market share game that drives mm. most other people. Uh, how, how do you manage to sort of mm. strike that balance? Well, <clears throat> I think, first of all, I think it would be... I don't think, you know, I don't believe in dominance, huh? I think uh, any sort of dominance leads to arrogance in the end of the day. And we have seen that uh, also within IKEA in some areas and some fields. When, when, you know, when we become number one, we stop developing. And I have a beautiful story where uh, also from our founder, Ingvar Kamprad, many years ago, uh, he and I met with one of our product teams in, in the uh, center of product development and design in IKEA of Sweden in Elmholt. And, and the group we met, they were very, they took a risk uh, knowing Ingvar. And they told Ingvar, we have a problem. And he said, what is the problem? We are the best. <laughs> and, so we, and they were actually, they, we had the best sales. We are the best in our industry. We have the best margin. We have the best quality. So we're not really sure what to do now. And I thought to myself, this is going to be a long day. And Ingvar thought, and he said something beautiful. He said, well, of course you're the best, but that doesn't mean you're good. And then he left. And the creativity that uh, initiated in that, and that, that is a remark that stays with me. You know, greatness is not about dominance. It's about being on the way. It's about having the capability, as we spoke to in the, in the um, uh, beginning of our uh, talk today, it's the capability of recreate yourself in spite of uh, your own successes, uh, so to say. So I think for us to have, if we can have 10% market share and be part of making homes better and also stimulate others to do well, we are super happy. Jesper, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us here in Delhi for your time. We wish you the very best of luck and look forward to seeing you again and hearing more from you about your plans for India. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Next time in snow or in the heat, uh, let's the, see. Probably the snow. <laughs> okay, I, I'm see. guessing you're, unless you come back to India to make the announcement. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Maybe, maybe then we'll see you here. Well, we look forward to that. But with Thank that, you. it is time for us to wrap up this edition of the Global Dialogue. From all of us here on the team, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.